everybody. It's Margie Meacham, and I am back for another edition of the Learning to Go podcast. With me today is Lisa Fain, the Assistant Director for the Center of Mentoring Excellence. And you may recognize the name of that organization because uh, Lois Zachary, Dr. Lois Zachary, has been on our program twice before, and Lisa happens to be the daughter of Lois. So uh, really exciting to see the generations uh, here at play in the Center for Mentoring Excellence. It's a very valued partner with us and also uh, just a really great resource for the learning professional. So Lisa, welcome. And let's start right at the beginning of what you do. Tell me what you mean when you talk about culture. Great. Thanks, Margie. So happy to be here. So a lot of people, when they think about culture, think about national nationality or national origin, and that's certainly part of culture. But when I'm talking about culture, I'm really talking about the lens of identity. And that can be things that you see, like your race, your gender, um, national origin, sexual orientation. Um, it can be things that are invisible, um, which include some of those categories we talked about, just I just mentioned just now, but also things like your um, values, your motivations, your generation, your life experiences, all of those things make up your cultural identity and therefore your culture. So it's really a broader definition that I'm talking about when I'm talking about culture. Okay, so then my next question is, is sort of connected that, um, so it's not just about looking at that broader sense of culture, but what you guys are um, really innovating in, in my opinion, is helping people develop greater cultural competency. So what does that look like? Yeah, so I think it's really important to define what cultural competency is. And a lot of people um, aren't, aren't really understanding what that means. It's closely related to diversity and inclusion. Diversity is sort of the who is in the workforce and inclusion is what you're seeking as you look to leverage that diversity. And cultural competency is really how you do that. And the key to cultural competency is understanding yourself first and then understanding others. It does not mean understanding every cultural nuance that's out there. But what it does mean is understanding the lens from which you approach um, the workplace, your work, problem solving, interpersonal relationships, and then using that as a way to understand how others do the same. So what got you interested in this subject? You know, it's it's a it's been a long, circuitous, and yet very. Um, uh, if I look back, it could have been a very obvious route as well. I started my career as a um, labor and employment management side lawyer, working for companies and helping them devise better and more fair workplaces, both through counseling and through litigation. Got interested in alternative dispute resolution through that, and one of the things that I realized the most is that so much of the um, uh, so much of the situations that had come to me could have, they came to me too late and they could have really been avoided or proactively planned for by understanding and leveraging difference. And so many times what had caused the breakdown in communication was the assumptions that people had made in the workplace about what people meant, what people's intentions were and so forth. So I got really interested in it that way. And then I became the leader of diversity and inclusion for a publicly traded company. And my knowledge and my experience got even deeper in recognizing that self-awareness and awareness of others, um, and really awareness of the context and the culture of an organization more broadly, was essential to creating fair, effective, inclusive, and engaging workplaces. Okay, so it sounds like, as you're describing that, that um, it is possible to identify kind of a shared consciousness um, within a culture. I, I don't know if my question uh, makes sense or if you would phrase it quite that way, but, but is that true? Is that something you've found? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot, there's, there are two ways to look at culture. When you look at the culture of an organization, you know, um, Edgar Schein has a really powerful model that's been used for a long time about the power of cultural assumptions and values and behaviors. And if you think of it like an onion with assumptions being at the center and behaviors being at the outside of the onion, 
a co organizational culture is really based on those behaviors, values, and assumptions of an organization. And they are made up of the assumptions, values, and behaviors of the leaders and the people who shape that culture. So to that extent, you're exactly right, Margie, there is a shared consciousness. And a lot of times what happens, particularly as our workforces are changing so much, both with the globalization of our workforce and with the exit of baby boomers and the entrance of more Gen Y, um, that we're finding that those implicit behaviors, values, and assumptions are um, being looked at again so that they can, or sometimes in unsuccessful organizations, not being looked at again, right? But it's so important to examine them as the workforce is changing to make sure that they are more inclusive. Okay, so that leads me to thinking about the learning professional, and, and our audience is uh, really anyone who cares about helping people learn and change behavior. So uh, coaches, mentors, teachers, instructional designers, trainers, how can people who help others change their behavior for a living, how can they tap into the power of these implicit behaviors and use them to help change behavior? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and in many cases, the $64,000 question, right? So um, the first piece is for those professionals themselves is self-awareness. I really believe, and one of the things we emphasize at the Center for Mentoring Excellence, is the importance of this sort of three-step process in creating change. The first, or creating cultural awareness, excuse me. The first is understanding self. The second is understanding others. And the third is understanding context. So for learning professionals, this is particularly important. Understanding self comes first because if you understand what your own motivations, values, assumptions, and cultural identity is, you can better understand when others might differ in those categories. And once you understand when others might differ, you can see it through a lens of acceptance and learn how to bridge those differences. And once you do that, you can see how it fits into the broader culture and begin to recognize where the cultural assumptions of the organization might differ and be less inclusive. So it really does always start with self. The second piece that I think is a really important to address in answering your question about what learning professionals can do in terms of is about showing up authentically, encouraging others to show up authentically, and helping to create a culture where people feel comfortable showing up authentically. And that's really, really important because studies show, and I know you know this and your listeners know this, that the more authentically people show up in the workplace, the more they're gonna deliver their best and achieve better workplace results. So what learning professionals can do and people who are looking at change is help people create their own self-awareness so that they can show up that way and help them identify what blocks there might be by sharing with the professional, sharing with the organization what might be standing in their way of the organization and what the organization can do to encourage showing up authentically in the workplace. Well, thank you, Lisa. And I want to actually, I want to highlight what you've just said. Uh, it reminds me a lot of a previous interview that I have with Dr. Paul Zak um, about the neuroscience of trust. And, uh, and it comes down to this, you can't fake it. We can tell you till we're blue in the face that you need to show up authentically. But unless you truly, truly are doing that sincerely, if you're trying to act authentic, that is the exact opposite of being authentic. And I, I think some people just have a hard time with that, of just uh, getting into that it starts with the self and it, it starts with knowing who you are so that you can be authentic in the first place. Uh, so I really wanna emphasize that that's where the whole process begins. I think that's just such, it sounds so simple, but I think in, in uh, practice, for many people, that's actually very challenging. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you know, there, there's all sorts of studies as well that show that this phenomenon called covering, which is when you do what you do, what you just described, Margie, which is acting authentic, right? I have air quotes going here, acting authentically, is really about covering. And there's more, so much energy spent in covering 
that it really takes away from productivity, engagement, and the ability to lead authentically in the workplace. Really important stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So anybody, if you feel like your job is exhausting, you might want to sit back and ask yourself where your energy is being spent because it's quite, that's one of the signs that you are spending too much energy on a facade instead of just being real and getting into the work. So let me jump to another uh, another question. Um, is it possible for a, someone's culture to actually hold them back? That's such a fascinating and important question. I have a belief that one's culture cannot hold one back. One's lack of awareness of one's culture can hold you back. Mm. There really is value in everybody's cultural identity. And you know the um, childhood poem, no two snowflakes are alike, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little cheesy, but it's true about people. It's, you know, you and I may share the same national origin. We may share the same gender identity and so forth, but our cultures are going to be very different no matter who we are. And whether that's learning style or communication style or what have you, our awareness of it can either help propel us forward or it can hold us back. So um, I think that's a really important distinction. The other thing is an organizational culture can hold somebody back. And that again requires that understanding of context that I talked about just a moment ago. So um, I think it's very important to understand one's lenses, to understand one's motivation, to, uh, motivations, to understand one's assumptions, one's values, which by the way are 100% influenced by one's culture. And when you understand that, there's nothing that can hold you back as a result of your culture. Okay, so how about just a couple of examples um, of things that you've seen in your work where um, looking through those lenses uh, benefited human performance in some way? And and you don't have to necessarily mention company names unless you're, you know, unless you're able to. Uh, but give us enough context that we can um, see an example of how this works. Yeah. So we've worked with a number of organizations where, uh, and we, we do that at the Center for Mentoring Excellence, no surprise given our name, through the context of mentoring. So my examples will really be in the context of mentoring. But, you know, we work at an organ, we've worked with a mentoring pair, for example, who, where the mentee works, uh, the mentee is way, is much more from a culture that is emotive and about feeling and um, expressive and where the expression of emotion is something that um, conveys uh, interest and engagement and um, uh, that one cares and is excited about a solution. And as many of your listeners will understand in uh, North American corporate culture, it's often the opposite, where the withholding or the restraint of emotion is something that's much more valued. And um, it wasn't it, it wasn't particularly valued in that organization the expression of this mentee's excuse me this mentee's expression of her own emotion, and she didn't understand how that could be tampering her effectiveness mm. in communicating. And rather than encourage her to withhold her emotions, which would mean to not show up authentically, right? Mm -hmm. And so often coaching in the workplace does that. It says, uh -huh. look. Expression of emotion is not valued, so you should withhold the expression of your emotion. What we encouraged her to do was to acknowledge that need in her communication, particularly with her supervisor, and say, look, when I express emotion, this is what it means for me culturally. So that the lens and the assumption of, the, of her supervisor wasn't that it was a sign of weakness, and was able to look at it as a sign of engagement. And similarly, we encouraged her to um, look at how that was being conveyed and see what she could tweak and still show up authentically. So that's one example of where culture really comes into play. That's a great example. A of, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because a lot of times people, when I tell that story, people say, so you told her to kind of rein it in, right? And actually, that's really, as I pointed out, the opposite of what we mm -hmm. suggested. Right. We suggested really acknowledging that difference, 
so they could get to a point of acceptance of that difference and learning how to bridge it. It's not about minimizing the difference. Cultural competency is, the, is about getting beyond this concept of minimizing difference and getting to a point of acknowledging and accepting and learning how to bridge that difference. So you know, that's just one example. Yeah. And that's a great one. And as you were telling it, Lisa, um, I have to share, it reminded me a lot of an experience I had as um, a new supervisor. Um, and I had a, um, a, a mentor who was actually given a formal mentoring relationship, which I was very excited about. And the first conversation was all about um, changing who I was. Uh, changing my clothes, changing, you know, my hairstyle, changing uh, my, how I expressed myself. And I think that that is still going on in a lot of workplaces that um, everyone is, is expected to fit a certain mold in order to move up, in order to be seen as professional and valuable to the organization. Um, so I'm really glad you shared that. And uh, hopefully the more organizations uh, work with the Center of Mentoring Excellence, the less of that stifling um, of diverse um, insights and lenses we'll have because we need everybody for an organization to succeed, not just the ones who fit our preconceived um, templates. Yeah, that's such a powerful point, Margie. It's one of the things we talk about a lot at the Center for Mentoring Excellence is this concept of mentoring as shifting from, you know, the mentor being the stage on the stage, on the, the stage on the stage, excuse me, to being the guide on the side. And what I mean by that in this context is it's very easy for a mentor to say, by being this way, I got successful, so you should be this way too. Mm -hmm. And um, yet that's really not effective. That's not about creating authentic leadership. By being the guide on the side, the mentor, the culturally competent mentor, gets to understand their own lenses, the lenses and the motivation of the mentee, and encourages their leadership by being a guide to help them develop authentically as to who they are. And so really, really, really key, what we see is that when that happens, the path of the mentee becomes um, uh, way more authentic, way more effective, and way more generative of high performance and business results. You know, and it sounds like the process also changes the mentor, which we know from neuroscience, both brains are rewiring themselves in sync as they get closer and closer uh, together as a mentoring pair, uh, we could actually see uh, parallel structures in their brains that are evolving. So do you ever have those, uh, the mentors express that, that they feel they've changed by the experience? All the time, all the time. You know, there is a reciprocity in the mentoring relationship that is um, often overlooked. And so often we hear mentees say, you know, I don't want to take up the mentor's time. It, you know, it's all about me. And the mentor saying, actually, no, I'm getting so much and I'm learning so much both about myself, about the organization, about how to motivate others, about my mentee. It is, it is so fulfilling for the mentor. And in terms of just looping this back to the idea of cultural competency, what mentors find is that their own skills in cultural competency and therefore their own ability to drive inclusion as a leader in their organizations is so enhanced through this mentoring relationship. Okay. So I know that your organization is always pushing the envelope, innovating new programs. So what are you working on right now that's got you the most excited? I am so excited about our Mentoring Excellence Masterminds, which we are creating and launching beginning in the new year. They are learning communities, year-long learning communities uh, for mentors and mentees in group um, coaching and mastermind um, uh, communities. And more details to come on that, but if you are interested or any of your um, listeners are interested, they can shoot me an email at L like Larry, F like Frank, a I N like Nancy at centerformentoring.com. There's lots more to come on that and we'll get you on our mailing list so you get the announcement as these are launched. 
Great. And you actually anticipated my next question, which is how does someone get in touch with you? So we'll have that information on our site and on the write-up of the podcast, everybody. And uh, definitely get a hold of Lisa for any um, any questions or if you want uh, to be on that mailing list to learn more about that exciting project. So, Lisa, I just want to thank you again for your time and your insights. I've really enjoyed talking with you. And uh, uh, please keep us posted on your Mastermind uh, program and maybe come back in about a year and give us a progress report. I think that would be a great uh, follow-up talk for you and I to have. Thank you, Margie. I'd be delighted to do that. It was a pleasure being here today. Okay, everybody, you've been listening to the Learning to Go podcast. I'm your host, Margie Meacham. I had Lisa Fain with me, the Assistant Director for the Center of Mentoring Excellence today. And thanks to all of you. We are one of the top 10 podcasts for learning and development professionals. Thanks for that. And keep listening, and we will see you next time. 